So um, we've kind of stumbled ourselves onto a little bit of a mini-series in the last few weeks. If, if you've been here journeying with us for the last two weeks, you'll, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. And um, so I'll just recap like super quickly. You know, we looked uh, at being planted, being planted a bit like a tree. And uh, actually, it was, it was last week we had Lynette up here pretending to be a tree and, and carrying fruit, remember? Big shout out to Lynette again. That was awesome. But we, we saw this picture of us being planted and, and, and our roots going down deep, going down deep into the river of life. And, and um, you know, we, we, we see in Genesis, actually, this river that, that flowed out of Eden and it, it watered everything in the garden. And you see, whatever was in proximity to the river was, was flourishing. The, the river was watering the garden. And, and so uh, we, we read the scripture in Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and 8. This is really cool. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like trees planted. Here we go. Planted by the water that sends its roots down into the stream or by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. It leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of a drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. So, you know, the question, the punch was, where are you planted? In what proximity are you planted to the river of life, to, to God? So that was kind of week one, and that's kind of where we started. And, and I didn't intend to go much further with this. It was just, it felt like a bit of a one-off message. And, and as I was prepping during, uh, you know, that, that middle of week two, God just said, no, nah, keep leaning in here, keep leaning in. And, and so we stumbled upon this, uh, this message called Seeking Fruit. And so we started breaking down this parable that we see of Jesus uh, at the fig tree, or talking about the fig tree, this parable. And uh, it was cool, you know, and just really quickly in, in Luke 13, 6 and 9, it said, a man went to look for fruit on this fig tree, but he found none. So for three years he'd been there, you know, he was coming looking for fruit, and he hadn't found any. And so he, he makes this statement, why should the tree, why should it use up the soil? Let's, let's cut it down. But oh, we see the gardener intervene, and he says, sir, sir, leave it alone for one more year. Let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. And remember, we talked about a bit of manure getting thrown around in your life, maybe. Maybe that's something uh, that fertilizer is actually trying to get producing fruit in your life. Uh, and, and if it bears fruit after I've dug around it, if it bears fruit after I've fertilized it, then great. But if not, then let's cut it down. And so this, this parable kind of gives us this picture that God actually comes seeking fruit in your life. God actually comes looking for fruit on your tree. And, and so that question or that challenge was, was what kind of fruit are we producing? And, and we dived into the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and all of that. But this week, you see, we've, we've, we've moved along a little bit and, and, and it got me thinking, what is the purpose of fruit? And, and we, we kind of touched on that last week, but what is the purpose of fruit? Well, two things that I see straight off the bat, and hey, maybe there's more, but this morning, the two things that I see. See, fruit is for food, isn't it? Straight away, who loves, who loves stone fruit? Who loves stone, like nectarines and like peaches? Yeah, yeah, stone fruit, good cherries. Oh, I love a good old cherry, eh? Uh, well, you know, what about vine fruit? Who, who likes strawberries and blackberries? And oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Who likes the classics, like the bananas and the oranges, the mandarins? Yeah, good stuff, eh? Fruit is so good. Ah, oh, yeah. So the, the purpose of fruit is food. But see, there's this other purpose which we're aware of. Fruit is to reproduce. The purpose of fruit is to multiply, to reproduce itself. And you see, all fruit that is naturally produced or growing, and, and I'm not talking about that genetically modified and engineered fruit that suddenly doesn't have pips or seeds in it, and you can just smash it back without choking on anything. Um, you know, the kids love it, eh? because they don't, they don't want to spit the pips out, all of that type of stuff. But see, all fruit that is natural, it has seed. It has seed or it has a, a pip seed in it. That's just how it is. That's how God designed it. So, so we've seen in, in this little mini-series, straight away we've got ourselves planted and we see this picture of, tree, of trees. Uh, we see fruit coming forth and then we begin to see this, the purpose of fruit. Having seed is about multiplication and reproduction. So we actually see a really great picture of this in Genesis. So if you've got your Bible this morning, we're, we're going to look at our two verses here. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. Those of you who are lazy, who forgot to grab your Bible this morning, um, it'll be up there on the screen. So you can check that out and, and, and follow with me. I'm reading out of the NIV this morning. It says, so God created mankind in his image, etc., etc. male and female, he created them, planted them in the Garden of Eden. We see that in, in Genesis as well. 
planted them there to work the ground, to, to, to work the garden. And then we see in verse 28, God blessed them. God blessed them. It's like this, this benediction. He blessed them. And, and what did he say to them? He said, be fruitful and increase in number. Other translations talk about uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, etc., 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 as the verse goes on. We're just going to park it there. Er, handbrake. Right here from the beginning, we see God created the process and the principle of multiplication and reproduction. So uh, I was chatting with a young couple um, at Grace Space yesterday, and uh, they said, oh, you know, what are you preaching tomorrow? And I kind of rattled off uh, this little bit of scripture in Genesis 1, and straight away they're, they're thinking like, oh, multiplication, reproduction. It's like, man, we've got one child. We can't even think about having another at the moment. Like, it's too soon. It's too soon. And we're like, we're too deep. And we're like, oh, man, I don't know about three. Like, that's, whoa, that's a big step, you know. But um, there's something about this bit of scripture that kind of gets our head thinking this way about reproduction. And, and, and so reproduction, we have man and woman, and we have a bit of Barry White playing in the background. And, and sooner or later, we've got many humans running around, you know what I mean? And God, God designed and created sex, okay? And, and we're talking about it now, okay? Oh my gosh, he's talking about sex. But God created it. It's, a good, it's part of, it's the circle of life. It's, it's part of, of, of that reproduction. So, but, you know, there's, there's more than just one form of reproduction. And we know there's, there's other forms of multiplication. And, and scientists often see it in, in the forms of cells, don't they? Blood cells and, and all sorts of different cells. As cells reproduce, as cells multiply, um, we know animals similar to us as humans, they, they reproduce as well. But, but there's also this picture of horticulture that we've lent into already today. Fruit trees and plants producing. You see, fruit trees are a great example of, of this uh, multiplication. And, and the seed of multiplication is inside the fruit itself, like we've already talked about. And this is, this is beautiful. That's, that's amazing. Like this is a, a miracle and a gift in which God has given to us. You see, think about the tremendous potential just within one little seed, and, and you've probably heard the sermon before. You've probably heard many people talk about the acorn or the, you know, or the, or the little seed or the mustard seed, and the potential in one seed, it can be responsible, particularly if it's a fruit tree seed. If it's an apple seed, it could be, it could be responsible for an entire orchard. And the crazy thing about, imagine this, if, if suddenly the apple tree was eradicated and wiped out across the whole face of the earth, yet you had the final, the last seed, the single seed. You know what? It wouldn't actually take that long to repopulate the entire planet with apple trees because the growth rate of multiplication in, in an apple seed is incredible. Like it might take three years from the seed to grow to a tree before it can bear fruit, but say the, the tree produces five apples in its first harvest. You know, five apples. On average, you might have maybe five or six seeds in each apple. Suddenly you've got 25 seeds and then you can plant them and suddenly, you know, the the, the growth rate just accelerates quickly. And, and so it would be a curve of kind of starting in slow, but it would just, whoa, it would rapidly take off. If, and, and at the same time, that, that apple can be used as food, but also for multiplication. So it's kind of this double-edged sword or this double banger. That's, that's pretty cool. I like it. I like it. So uh, the, growth, the growth rate that, that we see is amazing. God established and designed the process and the principle of multiplication. Do we believe that this morning? Do we believe that? Yeah. All right. Come on. Come on. See, it's a divine principle. It's divine. Anything that is alive instincting, instinctively, sorry, it will multiply. It will bear fruit. What have I got here? It's inherent. It's uh, instinctual. It's unavoidable. That which is living instinctively wants to grow and bear fruit and mature and, and, and multiply itself. Like I said, it's that cycle of life. God set it up. God set it up. By nature or by character, God is a multiplier. So this morning I've entitled this message, Multiplication. And so we're, we're running with that theme this morning. So, so what does this mean for us? If God is a God who, who set you know, the wheels of multiplication in, 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 in process, if, if he kind of set that principle in motion, what, is that, what does that actually mean for us? It means more than just making babies and reproducing. It really does. You see, there's this fairly common story that appears in all of the Gospels, in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And, and in this case, John is my favorite. Okay, the way that John brings this, this, uh, this common story out is, is pretty, 
pretty cool, and it's in John chapter 6, verse 1 to 15. You don't need to turn there because we're just going to kind of summarize it. A lot of us will know it, but if you don't, go home and read it later. I dig your teeth into it, but you'll know straight away when I said Jesus feeds the 5,000. This incredible story that we see in, in all the scriptures. And before you turn off and go, oh, I've heard this message, Pastor. Come on, man. Everyone preaches this one. Everyone's put their spin on it. There's nothing new under the sun with this one. Hold on, okay. Trust me. We're going to try and dig something fresh out. Um, if, if it's not fresh, it's still going to bless you because it's the word of the Lord, okay? So, so come with me. Jesus feeds the 5,000. So what do, we, what do we see in this story? We see this massive crowd that's out following Jesus. And, and they find themselves in a remote place and, and it's getting late in the afternoon. Okay, the, the disciples have got no means whatsoever to provide food for this, this ginormous group, this large crowd of people. So they kind of begin to worry a little bit and, and Jesus kind of knows what's up. He's kind of just playing them a little bit. And he's like, you know, where are we going to get food? Like, you feed them. And they're thinking, man, the, the closest town or the nearest place in, in order where we could get food is a long way away. In fact, if we had eight months' wages, you know, we, we wouldn't even have enough for everyone to just kind of have a bite. Like, there's so many people here. There's, the expense of this is, is huge. But what do we see in the story? A young, a young boy, a young boy comes forward and he says, you know what? You know what? I got five loaves. I got two small fish. It's all I got, but it's my lunch, but this is what I've got. So I'm going to rename the story. Is that all right? Okay. A young lad's lunch in the hands of the Lord. All right. So I've renamed it as that. A young lad's lunch in the hands of the Lord. You see, when things in our life get into the hands of God, oh man, get ready. Get ready because there's a blessing coming. Man, there's something of increase. There's something of multiplication. There's something that, that suddenly when God gets something of our life into his hands, oh, anything's possible. Who enjoyed that song this morning? Anything was possible. That was the first one we started with. Good way to, to, to launch into the service. So think about this. Put yourself in this lad's sandals this morning. We'd usually say shoes, but I don't think he had shoes on. He's probably wearing sandals. And So put yourself in the sandals of this, this young lad. Okay, he, he's there and, and faced with the situation. Okay, he's looking at the equation in front of him. Do you think that you would be brave enough? Do you think that, that you would come out of the crowd? Do you think that you would speak up and come forward and, and say, you know what, I, I don't have a lot, but, but what I have maybe could quench the hunger of this, this ginormous crowd. It's an interesting thought. Don't forget that that there would be a whisper in our ear of the enemy going, going something along these lines, you know. What, what you really have, is, is that really going to make an effect? Is that really going to have an influence? Is it, is it really enough to be able to feed 5,000 people? Is it really enough to, to quench the hunger of all these people? So what would you do if you were in this boy's position? If you're wearing his sandals, what would you be thinking? Would you be brave enough? I don't know. But there's this interesting quote that I, I read. I can't actually remember who, who spoke it, but if we offer nothing to God, he has nothing to use. If we offer nothing to God, he has nothing to use. You see, if this lad had kept his lunch to himself, if he, if he hadn't have given it to Jesus, what would he have done? He would have eaten it, and, and that would have been the end of it. We wouldn't have had the story. That just would have been the end. That's it. But because he brings it to Jesus, this massive crowd of people suddenly are, are, are fed this incredible miracle. And, you know, he gets as much as he would have got if he hadn't have shared it. So he gets his lunch, but so much more. But even more than that, he gets to bask in, 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 the, in the leftovers. He gets to share the joy of, of the 12 baskets that are left over. So it's this really cool picture, this massive miracle of multiplication that's taken place. See, what you have in your hands may be just small. What you have in your hands may just be insignificant. But when you place that in the hands of Christ, I want to say impossible dissolves. Impossibility dissolves when you place what you have in the hands of God. See, anything you take from self and you give it to Christ, I want to say that's a, that's a good investment. That's something that is well invested. See, the very nature or the very character of our God is that of a multiplier. 
You know, as Christians, we, we say this line quite a lot. We say that we've given our lives to Christ. We've given our lives to Him. But have we, in, have we done that in full measure? Have we actually st- stayed true to that transaction? Have we, have we kind of made that transfer actually happen? Is your whole life in the hands of God? I think that's a huge challenge. And I'm preaching to myself hugely here. Is your whole life in the hands of the Lord? Because if you give him nothing, he's got nothing to use. If you give him a little and withhold, I haven't actually given my life to Christ. And, or I don't know. That's, that's starting to mess with some theology maybe. I don't know, I'm not going to dive there, but think about that. Have you made that full transfer? Are the things in your life in the hands of God? Because like I've painted this picture this morning, we we serve a God by nature, by character, that is a multiplier. That's good news. That's incredibly good news. That's a blessing for us. You know, that's going to help you get through your Monday morning. It's going to help you get through the rest of your life, the rest of your days. Understanding and realizing that we, we serve a God that by character, by nature, He wants to bless and multiply. I don't know about you, but that excites me. That that gets gets my blood boiling a little bit. That gets me, not in a bad way, in a good way. See, what will he do if you give him your voice? What will he do if you give him your hands? And what, what is it that God could multiply if you give him your time? If you give him your brain, think about that. Your talents, your money, your heart. I want to say he will use it and he will multiply it. See, the fruit in your life, it's there for food, but it's there for multiplication. And I love it as well. We talked about the fact that that fruit on your tree that grows, you don't consume that fruit. That fruit is for someone else. But we see in the seed, you begin to be able to multiply that fruit that, that you are bearing. And, and that, that, my friends, is a, is, a, is a radically amazing picture. You see, Peter stood up. He gave God his voice. And what happened? 3,000 were saved in a day. What about Paul? What about Paul? He yielded his knowledge and his passion to God. And, and what? He became a prolific missionary changed the landscape of Christianity at the time, and, and his, his writings still challenge us to this very day, so fundamental to our Christianity. What about Esther? She gave of her beauty, and she saved her nation. She put her life on the line. She risked it all. See, all these ones, they knew this principle that their God, the God that they served, the God that they trusted in was a God who multiplies. And, and when they began to put things into his hands, suddenly they began to see that actually what God can do. What about Gideon? Oh, I'm the weakest. I'm the weakest. I'm, I, I've, got, I've got not much at all. You know, that's kind of his words. He's, he's just like, I'm the weakest in my tribe. God gave him a great victory. Let's choose to be like these men and women. Let's choose to be like this young lad who put his lunch in the hands of the Lord. Because that's that's simple, but I want to tell you it's extremely effective. I want to say it's extremely powerful. It's aligning yourself to a divine principle. See, things that are living, inherently they want to grow. They want to bear fruit. We shouldn't be standing in the way of that. We shouldn't be reducing or stopping that, that, that divine uh, nature of multiplication that would take place. Sometimes we wonder, why isn't our church growing? Why isn't our small group having an influence? You know, what, what's going on around us? And I think it comes back to that question. Have we given our lives fully to Christ? Because until he has it in his hands, he can't do a lot with it, can he? Interesting. See, this situation or this equation that this young lad was faced with, it didn't add up, but it didn't let him stop him. It, it didn't, he didn't let it stop him, sorry. He was able to, to push through, and, and we know Scripture that talks about that, that, hey, we must be like a child. Jesus says, let the children come to me. 
You know, we overcomplicate it. We put all this stuff and structure and things in place. And, and, and you know, it's, it's simple. We just need to come to Him. And this morning as we prayed pre-service, it was like, Lord, you know, with what we're bringing, you know, those in the band, those at the hosting at the door and the kids program, Lord, we just bring what we have. Lord, we just give it to you this morning. And Lord, we know that you'll bless it. We know that you'll multiply it. We know that you're going to touch someone's heart through what we do today. And our prayer was for you as a congregation, that you would come in and that you would simply just come and give what you have. Give of the resources, give of the gifts, give of the talents. I mean, he's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to, to have showers of adoration upon him. You see, God expects multiplication. It's in his nature. Do we expect multiplication in our lives? I don't know. It's, it's a message that, that I've enjoyed kind of chewing over because it's, you know, it's, it's simple, but there's such a depth to it. And we, can, we can call it as simple as we like, but, but if, we, if we hold on to this principle, if we, if we say, okay, God, you've, you've created in me this, this ability to be able to grow fruit, as I begin to, to give that out, as I begin to bless others, as I show your love and your grace, your joy, your peace, your forgiveness, your faithfulness, as the, the fruit of the Spirit, as I begin to do that, and that, that, can, that can ripple and, and, and multiply throughout our communities, ripple and multiply throughout our families. You see, we, we know what the opposite of multiplication or, or uh, sorry, not the opposite, but the, the, uh, the negative effects of multiplication. Like we only have to look at what's happened in the last you know, little while with, with COVID and, and how that's kind of affected the world. Suddenly fear and doubt can just ravage through the world in no time at all. Like the growth rate of that is, is insane. But I want to say that with Christ, man, anything can dissolve. Anything like that, anything that seems impossible to overcome, anything that, that, that seems like there's, there's no way ahead. How do we feed 5,000 people and a young boy? It wasn't the disciples. It was this young boy that came and just said, here, this is what I have. As we simply come and say, hey, God, this is what I have. We can see breakthroughs, we can see shift, we can see change, because our God is a God that multiplies. And I want to finish with Jeremiah chapter 17, uh, verse 7 and 8, which we've read it already. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. See, if we're a God of, uh, sorry, if we, if we believe or trust in a God who multiplies, that should give us confidence. And I like how this verse starts. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. What will they be like? They'll be like a tree planted by the water that sends its roots down deep, down by the stream. It doesn't fear when the heat comes. Its leaves will always be green. It has no worries in the year of a drought and it never fails to bear fruit. That's a picture that I want for my life. That's a picture of that, that I pray would be upon your life. That would be a picture that I pray would be upon our church's life, that we would be planted, that we would be fruitful, and that we would multiply, because that is what God expects. 